What? Yo. What? Who, who the fuck are you? I was talking in your Discord chat, yeah? Talking shit on communism. Raise your mic volume. What's your problem? I want to know why do you believe in such a, you know, big ideology? Why do I believe in what? In this ideology. Big? Big. Big? Big. Like the animal? Pig ideology. Yeah. Oh, where are you from? Lithuania. You're from Lithuania? Yeah. And why are you butthurt about communism? It's in my fucking blood. My no, it's ancestors, fucking not. My no, it's not. My ancestors shot communists in the fucking woods. I don't give a the fuck what your ancestor did, bitch. It destroyed my country, bro. No, it didn't. And many others. Delayed our progress by... I, I, there's... Well, hold on. What about the communists in Lithuania? I know them. Oh, all ten of them? No, they the don't matter. Retards? They exist. Yeah, and they're shunned from society for being fucking retarded, bro. No, they're shunned because Lithuania is kind of trying to bring back that neo-Nazi nostalgia, now aren't they? Neo-Nazi nostalgia? When yeah. Not? Oh, you don't think Germans fucked us too? We're tied with Poland for being the... The Soviet Red Army are the ones who liberated Lithuania from the fucking yeah. Germans. And the Poles. And they, sh and they shipped off 300,000 political prisoners on... Off to Siberia for what? Yeah, I keep keep Speaking talking the about these fairy tales. Listen, fairy tales. Yeah, every fucking Lithuanian. Nah, person. nah. Why don't you make it three hundred billion? Who gives a fuck at this point, right? But anyway, yeah, the Red Army are the ones who liberated. Hold on, who liberated Lithuanian cities from Polish control? From Polish control? Yeah. The Soviet Union before they occupied us. Okay, so you wouldn't have had those cities if it wasn't for the Soviets. Now, would you have? Yeah. We had them for like one month, for a year at most. I don't know exactly. Oh, and they were given back to Poland, all of them? No. After, what do you mean? In what way did the Soviet Union hurt Lithuania? Well, after killing like around 300,000 of us. Like, let's just say 300 trillion, right? No. Yeah, yeah. Like, how you're about 500 that, trillion? You're a billion. That is a big number. All right, a billion people. Okay, so tell me this. Why after the Soviets first... Uh, conquered us, illegally annexed us, why did so many Lithuanians fire on the German side out of sheer anger against the Soviet Union? Because it was a class war, because the Lithuanian bourgeoisie and the classes that had everything to lose from the Soviet... Yeah, uh, they left before that. Nah, they, they took nah, up arms and they it fought. The not the, it wasn't the intellectuals who were fighting the Soviets, it was young 19-year-olds. You're now a fucking philosopher or so an intellectual from someone. cities from cities yeah. yeah the urbanized yeah lithuania wasn't very urbanized then the institutionalized the institutionalized the you gotta understand back then tell me wh why why be angry at lithuania why be angry at the soviet union because they started shipping us away to siberia so did you get shipped away to siberia they removed the freedom of speech. Yes, we didn't have a lot of it, but we had a lot more than with the Soviets. And we had more freedoms. They didn't take our land. And so what was the problem? I just told you. You're saying there's a story 300,000 got shipped. 300,000? Over the period of around 5 or 10 years, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, Lithuania right now has a population of 2.7 million people. Yeah, back then it had a similar one, like 2.2 million. Villains. And you're saying 300,000 out of 2.2 million got yeah. shipped off to Siberia. Based and on even what? More, even more died during the World War II. A lot of Jews... You think we like the Germans. We don't. Jews were like, I don't know, uh, a seventh of the fucking population. 300,000. It was... Yeah, I, I don't big... know what, like, any of this shit has to do with anything. Like, what... Okay, you... Okay, you're, you're... The only thing you've given me so far is that the Soviets allegedly shipped 300,000 people out of the... I just find that hard to believe. Freedom of speech. Okay, who, hold on. Who... Okay, oh, wait, wait, you know what? You know what? Let's talk about freedom of speech. Got us. What's an example of a country with freedom of speech? Does Lithuania have freedom of speech? No, you can't say communist. Exactly. So don't, you don't, you don't clearly don't give a fuck about freedom yeah, of speech. No, Does America I'm have freedom against, of speech? I'm against it. I, I think they should speak their minds. Okay. America. So I what, what was the difference then with the Soviet Union? You can't say anything. The same in yeah. Lithuania now. No. Yeah. You just can't say different things now, but it's like the same. You go I to mean, jail if you support it's, Russia I now. That it's bad. I agree that it's bad that you can't say communist and fascist. So why are you... Okay, back let's then, say you're a guy who just then. wants freedom of speech, right? Why are you shitting yeah. on the Soviet Union then? Because Lithuania also doesn't have freedom of speech now. So it's clearly not a Soviet problem. It's maybe a deeper problem, but don't blame and just shit on the Soviet Union. They were banning 
most of the fucking books that were pu- published, the writers, most of them got killed or ran away to America. Okay, I, 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 I just have a hard if time believing that. If you weren't writing good stuff about the Soviet Union, I'm not saying that they were writing bad stuff, they're just not writing, not praising. That sounds like a, t- a tall tale to me. Sorry, I just, I have a hard time. No, Given I, what I know about the Soviet Union and the diversity of literature that was tolerated within the Soviet Union, including literature oh. that even in the Stalin era, there was literature that was critical and satirical of the Soviet Union and it wasn't banned. And this was in the 1930s. So I highly doubt that in Lithuania, throughout the entire duration of the Soviet Union, you couldn't have any writings that weren't, not only were critical of the Soviet Union, but didn't directly praise this. I just find that hard to believe. It just sounds like a crazy tall tale. I'd have a really hard time seeing, finding any book that was being published publicly and printed by Lithuanians criti- criticizing the Soviet Union in any way back then. There's no way that a single book like that ever existed. Yeah, it, it probably wasn't allowed to be direct, but I'm talking yeah. about like backhanded satire and all that. That was very common in the Soviet era. Yeah, it was. So but it was made in such a way so that the you know shitty bureaucrats wouldn't find out about it. What do you think is? Well, look, I, I have look. I look. Let, to, to, to be clear with you, let me I, hold on. To be clear with you, I'm not saying the Soviet era was perfect. I have critiques of the bureaucracy. Mao had critiques of the bureaucracy. Stalin had critiques of the bureaucracy. I'm not saying it's perfect. What I have a problem with is the way that you make it seem like the Soviet Union. You're singling it out unfairly as the problem when many of these issues. Not only continue to persist after the Soviet Union's gone, but even got fucking worse. I agree. So why single out the Soviet Union? I don't get it. I think I don't think it has anything to do with the Soviet era. I think it has a lot to do with nationalism and having a hostile attitude toward Russia today. It doesn't have anything to do with the Soviet Union. They have a hostile attitude against against uh, Russia right now. Well, there's been a hostile. Maybe I'm kind of a national, to be honest. I would love to bring back the old days of the Lithuanian Grand Duchy. You know. Well, if you're just more honest about that, you wouldn't have to hide behind liberalism and, you know, some kind of like humanitarian decrying of the evil of the Soviet Union. You could just be a nationalist instead of... uh, I think the word nationalist has changed a lot. I mean, like, I love my country and... uh, Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Lithuania is a proud country with a deep history of statehood and it's not like Latvia and and, uh, Estonia, which have no history of of, uh, state at all. No, it is. It is a real country with, you know, it's it's a proud history and tradition. So there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't see why that has to be bounded up with anti-Russian hatred. Well, they were the Russians in both occupations, the Russian Empire and the communists. They both tried to kill the national spirit of Lithuania. I don't think and that's then, true. Lithuania was no. Lithuania was a, Lithuania was allowed to be a a republic in the Soviet Union. Sure. So but the language was preserved. It yeah, doesn't it matter. Lithuanian, I think I, I'm going to go ahead and bet that Lithuanian culture was better preserved under the Soviet Union than it's being preserved now, where American liberal globalization is melting away at all differences. I'm going to make a bet and say that Lithuania no, no. probably preserved its culture better under the Soviet Union than it is today. Look, I don't like modern leftists. I don't like liberalism right now. I hate the way the modern world is looking right now, yeah? But I'm. I'm just saying, look at Lithuania in the interwar period, it was free. The fucking proudness of the people, the strength of the people, how they loved the country so much that 80,000 of them, it's a, it's a small fucking country, 80,000 fought for 10 years against the Soviets in a partisan. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 numbers, the numbers aren't fully known about how much... Yeah, it's not. I'm just giving a number. Uh, Wait, what? Process. What uh, is this the interwar period or the post-war period? Based. The partisans? Yeah. Loving the stream, Oz. You're a very Thank powerful you, you and inspiring comrade. Thank you much so much, you all. From- it started in the war, and uh, after the war, progressed a lot and grew to around 80,000. Yeah, but this sounds like the national, the type of national myth-making that a lot of post-communist states invented, almost in part artificially, to create this independent sense of national identity. Just like Ukraine did with Bandera and elsewhere. I mean, you may you you may have been taught to recall the partisan war in the uh, post-war period as like some glorious struggle of the partisans, but in the Soviet era, it was remembered as just a handful of bandits in the forest, just kind of no. leftovers fucking around. It was making so much. It was so annoying to the Soviets. I don't know who was the second in command, to, uh, Stalin, some uh, KGB guy or something. I don't know. Area guy. Yeah, I think him. He 
told Stalin, maybe we should just let these Baltics go. They're making too much trouble. And Stalin refused. Well, second that's, in command. That's, that's not because of Lithuania's resistance. It's because Beria didn't want... He, Beria wanted to give Germany back. Beria didn't want to expand the Soviet Union borders a great deal. And he also didn't want to expand the socialist bloc a great deal in general. And he wanted more reproachment with the West and with America in general. Sounds like a nice guy. But I'm pretty sure he was a fucking gun. We touched little kids. I, those have not ever been proven or corroborated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, I'm pretty sure. He looks now, like the type of guy to do that. Well, speaking as someone who's not a fan of Beria, a lot of shit was made up by the Khrushchev gang who overthrew Beria. You know, they, were, they represented the Soviet bureaucracy. Beria represented the um, NKVD, which wasn't just the secret police, but was like uh, the internal affairs of the Soviet Union in general. So there were all sorts of factions that were fighting each other. And a lot of bullshit was made up by the victorious faction, Khrushchev's faction. I think we kind of straight from the main point when we started talking about Lithuania. Why do you believe in Cam? What makes you believe that it's actually a good idea to distribute everything equally and give all the power to some retarded bureaucrats? That's not what communism is. It's not about distributing anything equally. And bureaucracy is a bad side effect, which the main communist leaders all saw as a bad side effect and did everything they could to curtail. Leading up to Mao, who pretty much smashed most of the Soviet-era Chinese bureaucracy. I mean, there's still bureaucracy in China, but they don't have the power they used to have. Can you like uh, give me a rough definition of what you believe communism is? Because Communism is when the government... Um, Sorry, it's not just when the government, it's not just political policy. Communism is basically when a country's productive forces are directed in such a way that maximizes the well-being of the majority of the people. Without governments, let's see. No, you do it with the government, but it's not so just the government. How do you prevent bureaucrats from being corrupt in such a system? Um, bureaucrats gain power in a situation where communism doesn't really manifest itself um, in a way that is economically reproduced by the people, which means people aren't doing anything independently with their own economic life to actually reproduce the system. They, the, the whole system is just top-down, centralized, from the top-down, based on a command economy, and that's really where the, the bureaucracy comes from, right? But you have a country like China, where people's everyday activities and everyday ac economic activity actually keeps the system together, right? You don't. You have less of a need for that kind of bureaucracy, right? You can have more kind of a uh, more decentralized way where the system can be used. And then also to be fair to more utopian thinkers, I right? Communism with capital, you're saying. There's that. We, we'll they call it markets, right? There's that. But then there's also you know talk about supercomputers and planning. I don't know if you know the guy Paul Cockshot, where you know um, cybernetics could allow for these both centralized and decentralized mechanisms of basic economic planning, scientific planning of the entire economy that happens in a decentralized way through feedback loops and inputs that come from the consumer level. Um, so there's all sorts of different ways you can mitigate. But the bureaucracy problem basically comes from when you're rapidly transitioning from an agrarian country to a modern country through um, socialistic and command economy planning. It's not just communism that had that problem. It's pretty much every you know, society had that problem. Japan had that problem. Communism, it never went away. Up what? until the 90s, it was still a command. Yeah, in, this, in the Soviet-led Eastern Bloc, uh, they never got, they never solved that problem. But the in question is country? why. Okay, in China, they kind of... Yeah. But now they're like, you have no privacy. That's, the government that's not you. true, actually. China is actually spearheading privacy laws that tech companies and tech platforms have to abide by, where you have to consent for any of your data to be taken, and, and consumers have far more rights as far as data protections are concerned compared to the West. And if, if you're concerned about government surveillance, you know, I don't know the extent of it in China. I would be surprised if it was that pervasive. I, I believe it's a lot. Well, I'll tell you what. It's a lot. If there's a lot, it's it's, if, if there's anywhere. a lot, that's just because people know about all of it. In America, I can guarantee you there's an equal amount, if not. Or, I don't do know if you know about. China will fall apart soon. What's that? Because do you believe that China will fall apart soon? No. Don't you think uh, the one-child policy is gonna eventually show its uh, progressions? Nah, that's something that comes from this YouTube essayist. I don't know. It's from the no. infographic show, wherever you got that from. No. Okay, the, the, Google, uh, the population graph uh, by age of China. 
Yeah, I, I, I heard that some yeah. people are saying there's a demographic crisis on the horizon. Yeah. People have been foretelling the collapse of China for decades and decades. I don't really see why this would lead to the collapse of China. Just don't see why. Because when a biggest chunk of your population are, how do you say, seniors that have to get pensions and there's not a lot of young people productive work. Yeah, but that's also mitigated by automation, right? And the fact, I mean, the reason why you're able to have that demographic um, composition in the first place is because of changes in technology and the way society's production is being organized, right? There's not a need Smart. for the same amount of labor as before in order to reproduce society. True. Yeah. And also, a lot of the things that people get paid for are not necessarily based in physical labor that seniors can't perform. So, I mean, just a lot of things. I mean, the, 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 how we don't even really know how the bulk of economic value is being produced in the 21st century. And I really have a hard time believing the majority of that is through physical labor. Look, I kind of thought you were a real hardline communist, yeah? Yeah. You don't seem like that much of a reality. You well, seem like you're not that against capitalism to the market. Uh, think- I don't know what it means to be against capitalism, but I definitely don't think China would have been able to get to the point that it is now if it yep. didn't have a command economy in the beginning. Because when oh. you're coming from an agrarian society, you have to centralize the forces of production and um, the means of production most in order to like um, direct them in such a way so as to like consciously um, promote industrialization and all that. that doesn't just happen spontaneously you know in a in a in a agricultural society so you're either going to remain backward forever like a third world country or you go down the hard path the communist states took and what you do with that i mean it varies right the netherlands yeah but all of those they were countries, making a lot of, they were were very agrarian from all. their industrialization was slow you know it was over the, time they were getting a lot of benefit the agrarian side yeah but you're talking that, about the history of europe so europe had the 30 years war they had all this crazy history of violence and peasant all you know protestant reformation before then europe and then the, the black death was a big factor but europe had like this huge problem they went through then they accidentally stumbled into capitalism because of its own specific history other countries don't have that same history, right? Europe went through a very chaotic process to arrive at something like industrial capitalism. And actually, only the only Britain actually arrived at, at being an industrial capitalist society. And it's through the banks that were created by British industrial capitalism that other countries were able to be industrialized in the first place through the loans that they were um, giving out, right? Even Germany, right? Uh so an, in, an independent path to industrialization that wasn't reliant on existing concentrations of capital uh, is only possible through communism. There's never been an example in history of a country pursuing that path unless they submit to the world economic system that was created by the British Empire. I think it was the banks who industrialized I think more so the culture of the English. Well, no, you the, the English, in, the English in arrived at the Industrial Revolution for their own reasons. Well, the British Empire was a huge factor in that, see. But yeah, they had their own reasons. But then the wealth that they created through that Industrial Revolution and through the British Empire, I should add, was channeled through those banks, which was then used to give loans to other countries that they could use to industrialize. So create a lot of wealth and use some of that wealth to help other countries as a as an investment. That's what we're talking about. And, uh, by the way, I kind of get why you would put Yeah, I don't believe that you should... Uh... You know, get banned in Twitch and stuff, leaving the Russian cause. It, uh, why do you see them in a good light? Exactly. What I see in 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 the case of Russia is I see a people, the majority of whom are were left behind after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Their their lifeline is coming from pensions or government aid or some 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 vestigial kind of fossil of the past. No one gives a shit about. They're not considered e- economically useful. They're not considered economically viable, and they're pretty much completely left behind. And I see in the case of Eastern Ukraine, a case where Russia's undergoing this internal revolution where they're trying to make a state for the people. They're, they don't care if these people aren't economically viable. They're going to wager on forging a state that represents and defends their interests, um, investing in them instead of investing. You know, most of today's economy is based in algorithms and wise investments they say and wise investments that are based on precedent i see what russia's doing is that it's investing in its own people despite the short-term economic losses that are going to come with that uh which there's no data precedent for i mean if, if you took blackrock's ai 
and you asked it, you know, is what Putin's doing wise? It would say no, right? So I find it very heroic and admirable. Putin and Russia is doing what it's doing, regardless of what the world thinks and regardless of what the economists think and regardless of what the technocrats think, according to globalist neoliberalism. You're saying Putin, Putin is for the Russian boy, yeah? Because as for, as, as, insofar as he's doing what he's doing in Ukraine, yes. Uh, you said, uh, you mentioned that uh, the Russian people kind of left behind after the fall of the Soviet Union, that they were poor, they didn't have much. Yeah. Uh, well, you know that that was caused by the oligarch because they bought up all the businesses. They were usually the, the, olig- the first oligarchs criminals in the Soviet Union. Yeah. They were the only ones who had money when it. Yeah. So they used that money and they bought up all the businesses. They got these massive monopolies on everything. And then, as you said, the Russian pool were left behind. And Putin, yes, he did eliminate some of those oligarchs who didn't support him most of them or he just ne- made new ones he still support it they're still there of course some of them are getting killed right now because they don't support the war and that's that's what i consider it putin. to be like this internal revolution is that i think it, but putin was fueling this uh, the poorness of his people he's not exactly i, I don't i don't think it was necessarily i think it was it's not so much putin's actions it's his lack of action putin wasn't doing enough for the russian people and i agree with that um, and he was not being hard enough on the oligarchs and the financial capitalists in Russia. And I agree not with just, that. But he was not, not being hard enough. He was recruiting them. He was, you know, trying to get political. You, you could say them. recruit them. Another person could say he was being conciliatory and compromising with them, right? And it means the same thing to me. He was not doing enough. I agree with that, right? But it's about which and where is the pendulum swinging, right? And to me, the pendulum is swinging more in the direction of the Russian people at, it, at the expense of these oligarchs, which have been a stranglehold on the Russian economy for so long. And I think this... I um, believe it's going to be at the expense of, because that, of all the things he didn't do. I think it's going to be at the expense of Putin himself. It, it may. Because of all it, the things yeah, it, he didn't do. It, it depends. It may, right? Um, it, it depends on how far he's willing to go and whether... So, for example, if Putin compromises and kind of, you know, he falls short of the Russian people's aspirations and demands, they may turn against him, right? Who knows? But so far, that's not what he represents right now. They're all rallying behind him because he represents this kind of defense of Russia and Russian sovereignty against the whole Western world. It's true that people, a lot of Russians are rallying. It's also true many and a lot of uh, Russians are rallying against him. Of course, they can't say it. Not. I don't think those Russians are a significant portion of the population. I think among the westernized segments of the population, there's probably you know, a lot of resentment about the Most fact... Most anti-communist Thank you, Ewald. Appreciate you. There's probably a lot of resentment about the fact that they're not able to like interact with the West in the same capacity as before or have those same connections. And, but that you have to understand that's the ruling class. That's kind of like the upper elite. I think for the majority of the Russian people, they're rallying behind. As this war drags on, it's probably, and it's probably, you know, the Ukrainian holding them back relatively. You know, they have a small, smaller ar- army and also they're doing pretty good right now. As this war drags on, more and more people in Russia will feel economic effects of this war and of the sanctions. And they're gonna, you know, who are they gonna blame? The Ukrainians? Or I, I, I don't, th- I think when it comes to, I think you're kind of being a little too materialist, right? I think when it comes to a people choosing sovereignty versus economic comfort, I think sovereignty and pride will always come from people. I don't think people will say like, oh, yeah, we're just going to like give up Russia's deeper aspirations because of the hardship we're facing. I think you know, people put their dignity before anything else. I mean, they've been facing hardship since Crimea has been going bad. Of course, it was slowly climbing back up, but it was still way down since before Crimea. So it's been a long time. No, before. the opposite effect has happened. Crimea and the recent operation have helped Putin. I think they've actually single-handedly have been responsible for the longevity of Putin's political career. I think without Crimea and without the recent operation, Putin, you know, Putin was um, being challenged by his opposition, the communists, pretty significantly and severely until he initiated the special operation, in which case the approval for Putin shot way back up and communists kind of lost out. Well, communists are irrelevant. No, they're, they're, the sec- they're the largest opposition party. Yeah, because 
every other one who's actually I guess eventually poisoned like uh, forget his name you know the it was a big story not long that uh, poisoned one of his political position i don't remember the name um yeah there's uh, been a lot of stories about people getting poisoned and those the details surrounding those stories are a bit shady oh no he didn't get poisoned he got arrested in an air police oh you mean arrested. navalny yeah navalny yeah navalny was never popular he was, he, he was never he was polling at like one percent in russia he was never relevant or popular he had no potential to ever represent anything i mean maybe he represented a hashtag that's so. only you're just trusting that uh, no i mean no western source is actually real i'm not saying that but i'm just saying nobody in russia wanted navalny to be their leader almost no one he was still a symbol of resistance Putin. he was still i rallying a lot of people behind i i am not sure it doesn't you matter could, if he's gonna be the president it matters the idea you know? i think navalny represented the western path Right? And there's a lot of people in Russia who represent the Western path. And some Russians showed some sympathy toward this before the recent operation. Now it's completely gone, right? I mean, there, they, because there was this illusion people had that Russia could somehow coexist within a Western, like, European-led order. And Russia could just be a part of that and it could have its... It could be respected within that, and, and it's clear that's not possible. The Soviet Union has to join NATO and yeah. because it's an anti Soviet Russian alliance. Can't have group power. With yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the point. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 5 a.m. in Lithuania, so I go on right now. All right. Now, I don't really know what we can do more. Like I said, I respect you. I don't really believe a common idea. You know? Yeah, that's fine. There's still a lot that has to be elaborated about communism and you know, just pointing to China, I know is really not that convincing right now. So that's pretty fair. In terms of COVID, I may have a radical idea making China pay for because of okay, no. <laughs> it's a little radical. Well, I, I don't know if I could talk about this on YouTube, but I think um, you should definitely do some oh, yeah. more research about the origins of uh, a recent event. And I'm not sure China is actually the culprit, but um, yeah, with that being said... Yeah, good talk. Yeah, see ya.